Jesus was a rock star. If you would pray with me, say, Jesus, help me to be what you want me to be. Do what you want me to do. Because people without you go to hell. I've been showing you this video for weeks. I find, and that's another reason why I couldn't change my mind and preach something different. Then it would have been four weeks of telling you about this and it never would come. But it is here now, when the devil knocks. When the devil knocks. Now this is not a devil glorifying series. That's what we, if you're here for the countdown, uh, we, we had Run Devil Run and David Crowder. That's a great song. I just And the second song, if you're free, show it. The words of that song are awesome. I just couldn't figure out a way to do that in our praise and worship, so that's why we're doing it uh, the way we're doing it. But we are in a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual battle. There are devils and demons. So there's Satan and there's demons. Demons, most scholars agree that where the demons came from was... Uh, when Satan left heaven, Jesus talked about it. We see it in other places in the Bible. He grabbed a third of the angels with him and pulled them down to planet Earth with him. He led a rebellion. Didn't go well for him, um, but he led a rebellion. And, and that's where we get uh, devils and demons. Uh, we're not talking about demons in this series, well, I, but I will tell you this. The best way to deal with the devil is to ignore him and just draw closer to Jesus. That's how you deal with the devil. Don't try to fight him yourself. There's no, there's no magical, in, you know, uh, things that you can say that are, you know, it's just, you just get, the closer you are to Jesus, the more hands off the devil's going to be. Um, but the devil, he comes and he knocks. And he has a purpose and a plan for your life. I prayed about it today, that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. God, and God's plan for you is good. It, God's plan for you is awesome. It is so good, you guys. That when he created you, he created you specifically to like and enjoy certain things. Anybody here a football fan? Anybody here a football fan? A few football fans out there? Yeah, not me, not a football fan. I'm not very manly. I'm very unmanly. I, and I've, I've hardly watched any football. I've only seen one Twins game in my whole life. It's, it's baseball. I do know that. Anyway, um, thank you. It's hard today. I'm telling you guys. Um, but he created you specifically. You like certain things that are different than me. You're good at things that are different than me. Uh, you're bad at things that are, are different. That God created you specifically. And he cr created you for a specific purpose and call. And the good news is when you begin to walk in that purpose and call, that's life. I mean, that's as good as it gets. When you know that you're doing what God created you to do, that is the best feeling on this planet. And that's my hope and prayer for each and every one of you. Because I know that I know that I know that God's call is on you, and it's specific, and it's unique to you. Satan also has a plan for your life. And his plan is very simply to hurt you as much as he can, to hurt the people that you care about as much as he can, and then drag you kicking to hell. That's his plan for you, is to hurt you and to destroy you. And make no mistake, even though we don't pay attention to the devil much on Sundays, there is a war happening. There really are demons that are out to destroy you. Now, you're not even really supposed to fight him. You just run to Jesus, he takes care of it. I mean, it's, you have authority. When, it's kind of like if you walk outside and, and you have an umbrella over you, and you walk outside in the rain, you stay dry under the umbrella, right? But if you run out from underneath the umbrella, then you get wet. God, when you serve God and when you're obedient to God and you love him and he owns your life, you are under the umbrella of his authority. And Satan cannot hurt you. He, he can't. The only way that he can hurt you 
is a couple of different ways. Number one, if you leave God's protection and he never forces you to stay under the umbrella, you can leave anytime you want. And I've had people come, I'm so mad at God. I, I hate God. I'm mad at God. And then they, they tell me all about all the stuff, why they, why they hate God. Well, I'm sorry. It wasn't God's fault that you did all those stupid things. Okay. It wasn't God's fault that you haven't prayed for who knows how long. And that God didn't do this to you. Dude, you did this to you. Okay, so if you leave God's protection, if you leave this, his authority, if you do it your way, well, then you have to own that. I mean, you did that to you. There is one other way the devil can hurt you. And that is if God lifts his hand of protection for a purpose. You say, whoa, God, Scott, when would God ever do that? Well, look at Job. Satan came to God and said, oh, God, let me harass your guy Job. And then we'll see how much he loves you. And God lifts his hand of protection from Job. He puts limits on the enemy. And then the enemy, of course, hurts Job. And then um, he, uh, he doesn't fall and God has his way and, and Job gets everything restored. You know. but, uh, but, so those are, so, but if God lifts his hand of protection off of you, is that because he's mad at you? No, not in Job's case, right? Is that because he doesn't like you and likes to see you hurt? No, I promise you, your Jesus hurts with you every, every tear you fall. He is hanging on every drip. He loves you that much. If God lifts his hand of protection from me so that the enemy can tempt me or try me or whatever, it's because he's running. he uses the enemy to shape us sometimes, which is a different sermon. I don't know if we'll get there, but he uses the enemy's attacks to sharpen us and to draw us closer to himself. But in both cases, I can trust him. I, if God is lifting his hand of protection and giving the devil an opportunity to take a shot at me, I can still trust him because I'm in his protection. Sometimes we don't protect our kids. You ever, you know, you ever have your kid do something and then you let them feel you know, that a little bit? It, God is so, you can trust him absolutely, and, but don't make any dis mistake. The enemy hates you. He's looking to hurt you as much as he can and then drag you off to hell. Check this out. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Satan, in the next three weeks, we're going to take a look at Satan is the deceiver who will attack your mind with lies. All right? Then we're going to talk about Satan is the destroyer who attacks your will with pride. And today we're going to talk about Satan is an accuser who attacks your heart with accusations. Because he does have an attack for you. And he's not powerful, but he is smart. He's been doing it this for a long, a long time. But the scripture tells us that no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every voice that has accused you. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon turned against you will succeed. If you're uh, in the King James, this is New Living, it would say no weapon formed against you will prosper. That might sound more familiar to some of you. No weapon formed against you. Are Nothing is going to work. Why? Because if every Satanist in the world if they got together and they were a Satanist, this is a true story. I, you're not going to think it's true, but it's true. But when I was in the seventh grade, there was a group of kids in the eighth grade. Wasn't Yeah, it must have been because they weren't in, at Fargo. So that back then, it was Agassi, Agony Junior High anyway, here in Fargo. Um, but I was in the seventh grade. It was the first year I was serving Jesus. I had a Bible study in my house, and there was a group of Satanists there. Now, it was the 80s. And, in, and so the, that LeFay dude, the, and you study him, he wasn't even a real Satanist. But anyway, uh, the LeFay guy was on TV. Geraldo Vieira was interviewing Ozzy Osbourne on, on TV and stuff. And it was really hip to be a Satanist in the 80s. And uh, so they, they would do stuff like they, they burned a Bible after school one day and stuff, and they, uh, which didn't, you know. And, and then they, they told everybody, I don't know if they did this or not, but they told everybody in school they sacrificed a cat. Okay, so anyway, but most Satanism uh, stories, by the way, turned out to be false. But anyway, uh, but every Satanist on the planet communicated with each other, and they all sacrificed a cat, which would be the only blessed thing the Satanist ever did. And they all sacrificed the cat, and they they all prayed to Satan, 
You know, there's no Satan worship songs. Oh, sweet Satan. They don't get to do that. We get to worship Jesus. They support people. And they, and they all had one prayer. And they all got on their knees midnight on Halloween after sacrificing a cat. And they said, oh, dear Satan, our prayer to you is that tomorrow morning when Pastor Scott gets out of bed, he stubs his toe. If every Satanist on the planet got together with the single purpose of making me stub my toe, there's only one way I'm stubbing my toe. What are they? Two ways, right? If I leave God's authority, if I walk out from under his protection, or God says, all right, Scott, you're going to get your toe, your toe stubbed, which he does, by the way. But that's the only two ways. And if God lifts his hand and the devil stubs my toe, guys, my toe needed stubbing. Do you hear me when I'm walking under God's protection? That is how powerful God is. But Satan in the scripture is called the accuser. All right, look at this. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. Now this is looking at the very end when, when all these things happen and Satan is hurled down. But it, it tells us what Satan's job is right now. What is one of the major jobs that he has? He was doing it to Job. He was accusing Job, saying, hey, God, Job doesn't really love you that much. God, he's accusing Job. Satan is making accusations against you. That's his role. For the, the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Actually, the Greek word uh, for Satan used 35 times in the New Testament is diabolos. Which is actually, isn't this also Spanish for devil, I think? But diabolos is the Greek pronunciation, uh, not pronunciation, there's a Greek word for that. And th what Satan does is he accuses you before God, which probably doesn't go very well, because the only thing God is going to let the devil do is something that's going to benefit me. And he does that, but it's a different sermon. But before you sin, the devil has something that he, he says. He says, hey, you know what? Um, it, before you sin, the devil says, you know what, it's really not that big of a deal. You know, the, Satan's talking to Eve. You won't really do that. You know, it, it's really not that big of a deal. So before you sin, uh, it's like no big deal. No one's going to find out. After you sin, it's like, dude, you deserve what you got. After you sin, you are nothing. How could God love you? Your life is ruined. You're pathetic. See, because Satan accuses before God, but he also accuses before you. When you come, he says, you know what, you're really not forgiven. Those people will never accept you. The people at that church, they, they look like they try to say nice things to you on Sunday, but they don't really care about you. Because if they really knew you, they couldn't love you. I know what that feels like. If they really knew me, how they couldn't love me. And that's why the Bible says, confess your sins to one another. You know why we're told to confess our sins to one another? It's because if when you confess your sin to a real Christian, they're going to look across and they're going to say, I love you and I believe in you and we can get through this together. I love you, I believe in you, and we'll get through this together. That's what a real Christian will say to you. And that's why the Bible says to confess your sins to one another because when you have done something and the devil is coming at you and he's accusing you and saying, you are a loser. How could anyone ever love you? You are never going to get through this. Well, when you confess your sins, you need to have a friend. You need to have a Christian. You need to have somebody in your life that you're going to tell the most horrible thing that is ever you've ever done. The thing that you are the most ashamed of in your entire life. And when that person is a true follower of Jesus Christ, you know what they're going to do? They're going to look at you and they'll, they'll use different words in this, but they're going to say, I love you, I believe in you, and we're going to get through this together. I'm going to use that phrase a lot in this, uh, this month, maybe from now on. But that's the kind of church God wants us to be. That no matter what, what kind of abhorrent thing that person across the coffee table tells us, that our response every time would be, I love you, I believe in you, and we're going to get through this together. But Satan, he's telling you, no one's going to love you. If you tell them that, you will never be there again. 
He is, in, he is the accuser. After you sin, before you sin, oh, it's no big deal. Nobody will find out. After you sin, you are nothing. You are a loser. If they knew what you just did, nobody would love you. When the devil talks to you about God, he lies. Satan said, hey, why, why don't you eat that fruit, Eve? I mean, then you'll become like God. I mean, God really didn't mean, whenever Satan talks to you about God, he lies. And when the devil talks about you, he accuses. When he, before you sin, he lies to you about what your sin is going to do. He, 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 when he talks to you, he lies about God. But when he talks to you afterward, it's all accusations. Now, the book of Zechariah, it paints this really amazing. And I, want to, I need to set this up for you a little bit. Uh, now, whatever generation you are, uh, 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 Perry Mason, uh, Matlock, uh, or, or Law and Order, boom, 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 boom. Okay. Uh, picture this in your mind because this, this is the exact picture that we have in the book of Zechariah. All right? We have got the court and we've got the, different, we got the different players. God is the judge. Joshua, the high priest of that time, this is not Joshua around the, around the, around the city. Joshua is a different Joshua. But Joshua, the high priest, is the defendant. Okay? And Satan is the prosecutor or the accuser. All right. This is what we find in the book of Zechariah. So God is the judge. Joshua is the accused. He's the high priest at that time. He's, and Satan is the uh, prosecutor. And he's trying to prove Joshua's guilt. And he begins to, he, he's saying that, man, look, look at, at Joshua. His robes are filthy. He is full of sin. You made him a priest and he corrupted it. Look at this. <coughs> Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is it not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes, and he stood before the angel. Now, when it says the Lord rebuke you, Jesus, we have a Christophany here. This is a, a messianic verse because this is Jesus. We see Jesus in the Old Testament in a few different places. This is one of them. Another one was when, when Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. When they're in the fiery furnace, they said, we looked in the furnace. It's not how you really say his name. We looked in the furnace and we saw a fourth man. That was a, a type of Jesus. Jesus was in the flames with him. And we get to see this. And he's underdressed. He's not dressed appropriately. It was a big deal when you were a priest. Because everything was symbolic and he was underdressed. And Satan is there. He's making these accusations. And he's doing that to you today. He's, saying, he's making these accusations. And he said, what? Didn't, didn't Craig steal? Didn't, didn't this guy over here, didn't, didn't he do this? Didn't he do that? Didn't he, didn't he preach a sermon a little while ago and said a bad word and used a word for waterfall instead? Um, he lied. He yelled at his kids. This person is divorced. Obviously, they, you know, they, they've gone through bankruptcy. This person is addicted to porn. I mean, if you knew what they... God, did you see what they were watching Saturday night? This person had an abortion. God. It's a secret. And, and there stands the accused, filthy, ashamed, unworthy, and the accuser is hurling insults. But before we go forward, we got to remind you who Jesus is. The devil is the accuser, but Jesus is your advocate. No matter where you're coming from today, no matter what sin lies in your past, it doesn't matter. Because Satan is your accuser, but Jesus is your advocate. He is on your team. Look, my dear children, John 2, 1. I am writing you this so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. And he is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. 
So as the accusations are flying against you, even this morning, as I've even named a few sins that the enemy might be attacking you with, and you feel that shame, you feel that unworthiness, I have got good news for you today. Satan is the one accusing you in your mind. He is out to kill, steal, and destroy. And that was always his purpose and plan for your life, is to hurt you as much as he could and then kill you. That's always been what he wanted. But that isn't who's on your team. You stand with an advocate in Jesus. And I just told you how much tougher God was than Satan, right? Every devil worshiper on the planet, if they said, now I lay me down to sleep, uh, stub Pastor Scott's toe before he wakes up, whatever. He couldn't do it. Satan is absolutely... Now, if you fight him, you'll get toast. But when God's got your back, it isn't even... When, when there was a rebellion... So when I was younger, I used to have this idea that Lucifer went out and got all the angels and there was this great war in heaven. You want to know something? There was no great war in heaven. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. God, God, there was no battle. God shrugged his shoulders and said, you're done. That's what the war was in heaven. That's how much more powerful God is than Satan. So no matter what is accusing you today, Jesus is your lawyer. The angel, they were back in, in Zechariah now, the angel, and this is the typophily of, of Jesus, is a, the angel said to those who were standing before him, Joshua, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sins, and I will put fine garments on you. Satan is accusing you and saying, You did this. You did that. You are nothing. You can't make it forward. And the problem is, he's right. The problem is, is that Scott is sinful and deplorable. That if there are things that this Scott won't ever preach from the pulpit. I'll tell you one-on-one -on -one some of the ugliest things about me. But I, I, and I'll be honest, maybe I should, but I'm scared you'd reject me out of hand. But whatever, but, but he, I, because it's true. I can't hide from it. I did those things. I was that person. The accuser, see, the problem with the accuser is he's right. He's right about me. I am those things. But then Jesus comes. He says, take off his clothes and put me, give him new clothes. I have taken away your sin and I will put a fine garment on you. We find out in the New Testament that when we come to Jesus, he clothes us, the Bible says. He clothes us in righteousness. He wraps his righteousness around us so that we're completely forgiven. No matter what you have done today, the gospel of Jesus Christ tells us that no matter what you've done, if you give your life to Jesus today, you are completely saved. That you get to go to heaven forever. How do we know that? Well, we got the two thieves on the crosses, one on one side, one on the other side. And that guy comes to Jesus, he'd spent his life being a mean son of a gun. And Jesus says, hey, today you're going to be with me in paradise. In a moment, he was completely forgiven. So when the accuser comes, yeah, I was all those things. I said it last week. You know, we, why is Rahab the prostitute? Why is it that she's always referred to as Rahab the prostitute? Six times she's mentioned in the scripture, never just Rahab. She's always Rahab the prostitute. Because God's goodness is too good not to shine a light on it. You maybe were those things, but God wants to clothe you in righteousness. Then I said, we're back in Zechariah, put clean, a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they clothed him. And while the angel of the Lord stood by, again, type of Jesus, the angel of the Lord gave his charge to Joshua. And if you are here today, and you've been accused, number one, today you can be wrapped in Jesus' righteousness. You can be completely forgiven. If you've been wrapped in his righteousness, this next verse is for you. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge over my courts. And I will give you a place among these standing here. 
if you come under my protection. You see, now I lay me down to sleep. Please, I'm sorry about my sin, God, but I'm not going to change my life. That is not what we're talking about here. If you're trying to serve Jesus with a now I lay me down to sleep life, and that you're, you're apologizing for your sin and you're not repenting for your sin, the difference is when you repent, you change directions. You fight that sin with everything you have. If you're apologizing for your sin, I, you know, maybe you'll make it in heaven by the hair of your chinny chin chin. There's a lot of scriptures that would make me uncomfortable. Okay? But when you come to Christ you, in obedience, then you get to govern his house. What's that? That's what I opened with today. That's his call on your life. That's the purpose and plan that he has for you. See, he has things that he wants to put you over. He's got things that he needs you to do. That's his purpose for you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. When you've done something wrong, it's important to distinguish between Satan's accusations and the Spirit's conviction. If you have not re repented of your sin, the shame that you feel is conviction. Until he's wrapped you, it's totally appropriate that you feel that shame because you still own it. You haven't given it to Christ yet. You see, accusation drives us away from God. Conviction leads us to God. Accusation is all about guilt and shame and self-loathing and I can get, never get out of this. Conviction leads us to repentance and hope. Satan accuses you. He wants you to feel guilty. He wants you to experience regret and remorse for the rest of your life. But the Spirit convicts to draw you into the presence of God. That you get forgiven and then you get to experience what Paul talked about. And he said, I stand in the very presence of God, assured of glad welcome because I come in Christ Jesus. And that's why we worship like we do. That's why I normally have a song in there that, that the lyrics get repetitive. There's an instrumental. It's because I want to give you a moment in time when you can stand right before God's presence. Because if you're not right with God, that's when it's really going to pinch. When you go to worship and you lift up your hands and you know you're not right, it's hard, man. It's hard to fake it. Because when you're in His presence, it exposes you. There's no hiding in His presence. God's presence illuminates. It illuminates everything. So why? We confess our sins to Him, and we also confess our sins to each other. Why? Because if you need to get the accuser out of your head so that you can have a Christian brother or sister look you in the eye and say, I love you, I believe in you, and we're going to get through this together. That's why we confess our sins one to another. The devil knows your way, name, but he calls you by your sin. God knows your sin, but he calls you by he calls you by name. That's our God. I'm gonna skip ahead because I've I've run out of time. I had too much fun with you. Thank you, God. Would you bow your heads with me today? Thank you, Father. Lord. We here at Rock Church, we are not a perfect people. We are a sinful, broken people. And Lord, I thank you that you take us right where we are. That you clothe us in righteousness. So Jesus, I pray that every person in this place could just bring you our shame. Lord, I bring you my shame. And just ask God that you would change in me. Lord, I thank you for David when he did that terrible sin, murder, adultery. And then he said, God created me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit in me. See, God, I thank you, Lord, that you don't leave me addicted to sin. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Lord, that crazy Crowder song that we had for the countdown video, if you're free, prove it. The lyrics in that song are awesome. I wish I could do it as a worship song, Lord, but I just don't think it'd work good. But if you're free, prove it. Jesus, I pray that you would set us free. 
Set us free, Lord. We repent of our sins today. Make me new. And Lord, our life then will be yours. And God, I thank you that the sin that I struggle with today is not the sin that I struggled with a year ago. It's not the sin that I struggled with a decade ago. The God that every day I serve and press into you, I become more like you. And Lord, I just pray, God, for each and every person in this place that they would get to know the fun and the passion and the exhilaration that comes when we live a life that you called us to live. It's a life of passion. It's a life of destiny. It's a life of meaning. And oh God, that every person in this place could experience that. So Lord, I give you my life. Today, if you were able to pray that with me, and you repented of your sins, and you gave Jesus your life, could you just do something to bless me? And just put a cross on your card where the prayer requests are. Just put a cross there. And it's just saying, Scott, I prayed with you, and I want that. Some of you maybe didn't pray that. I'm going to give God my life one more time. And I'm going to invite you to do it with me. And then go ahead and put a cross on that card. So Jesus... This day, my hopes, my dreams, all the stuff I thought I had to do and had to have, I all lay it at your feet, Lord. And I tell you, God, there's nothing so small I won't do it for you. There's nothing so big that I'll shrink back from it. I just need a nod from you and I'm running. God, all I need is a nod from you and I'm there. When I'm tired, when I want to give up, I'm going to still be there, God. When I want to quit, I'm just going to keep pushing. Because you own me, God. I am not my own. So Jesus, I embrace you today. Thank you for embracing me. Thank you, Jesus, for winning my robe of righteousness. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus was a rock star.